everyone. So many folks. So great to see everyone this morning. How are you all doing? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, maybe a little more coffee. How are you doing this morning? Yeah, yeah. That's what. All right. So early too. Awesome. How was the food? Good. Awesome. Great. Well, there's more left over, so stick some in your pocket for later. I am Libby Mahaffey. I'm going to be helping to MC today. I'm a longtime fan of SCC, and I'm happy to be here. So many folks just really excited about this morning and about our launch of uh, SCC's 50th anniversary year. I know! 50! So, so who in the audience has made it to 50 years? Yeah, no, clap, clap, clap for yourselves! Yeah, how many folks in the audience are just hopeful you're gonna make it? Yeah, all right, yeah, some optimism, awesome. As you may know, this morning kicks off uh, SCC's 50th anniversary year, and pretty awesome. Uh, the, you have programs on your tables. This is Together Into the Future. One small step and one giant leap. And if there's any organization that exemplifies together into the future, and especially that together part, it's SCC. And so you'll notice, right, that 50 years, that means that 1969 was kind of the birth of SCC, and you'll notice we have a theme. What else happened in 1969? Any history buffs? <laughs> Here, anybody gonna guess? Moon landing, right, and a lot of other things. And also, right, moon landing. And so you'll notice the, the theme of today and of the 50th anniversary year and of this morning is kind of launching us into this year together. Before we, before we bring on the mayor um, to say a few words, um, I wanted to acknowledge a few special guests that we have in the audience today. So City Councilor Bill White, City Councilor Jesse Klingen, City Councilor Mark Niedergang, School Committee Member Andre Green, City Councilor Katiana Ballantyne, uh, City Councilor Ben Ewan Campen. Thank you. I cannot read my own handwriting. Sorry. Uh, State Rep Christine Barber and State Rep Mike Connolly. It's amazing. Awesome, so many folks out to, to celebrate and launch SCC. And now, uh, the man who needs no introduction, and not just because his holiday card is still on many of our fridges, um, but uh, this is a longtime supporter of SCC, uh, and actually one of our 50th anniversary advisory team members, um, Mayor Joseph Curtitone. Thanks, Levy. Good morning. Good morning. It's great. Uh, well, welcome to my neighborhood. I actually live here. Andre Green and I literally live around the corner, uh, which will come in handy if I have to use the shower facilities for some reason this morning. But uh, I want to welcome you on behalf of my colleagues who I serve with, the local and state government, and so many advocates and activists. I want to give you all a big shout out for so many who testified uh, to support our state delegation for the home, uh, the real estate transfer fee to be passed for some of them. So many of you waited several hours, several hours. We are grateful for that work. I also want to recognize uh, the rep representatives of the city's housing division and the Office of Housing Stability here in the room today. Thank you for all the work you and Mike Filoni, Ellen Schachter, and crew, thank you. Um, 
Happy birthday and congratulations to the Somerville Community Corporation on celebrating 50 years. 1969, I was celebrating three years old, Danny. <laughs> but I think I was trying to recall, and being very young, and Bill White, since you're a little older than me, I'll be kind. If, I, if I'm not mistaken, 19, 1969 saw a new activist and reform movement in the city of Somerville. Um, the city was changing at that time for the good, breaking out of molds of corruption. Um, people were getting active. There was a new mayor who was elected. Uh, S. Lester Ralph was a reverend. Am I right, Mary? I won't. You were around before me then, too. I'm sorry I have to say that. And there was a call for new civic activism and organizations. In fact, 1972 was the culmination of that activism, where Somerville was recognized as the All America City. And organizations like the Somerville Community Corporation sprung to life and have had impact socially uh, and on the quality of life uh, since then in Somerville. Uh, and it's important we reflect and understand the context of that history. Um, but I, can, I can't really remember a time when SEC hasn't been an impactful part of, of this community. Uh, the city has certainly changed a lot in the last half century uh, and it continues to change. And the S SEC has been there to offer assistance and resources uh, to residents, but residents would also play an important role along with all the other nonprofits and some social service organizations. The institutional city government cannot do it on its own. What threads it together is that activism, is that advocacy, are those organizations. And that's what makes some of them, I, I submit, very unique. Over the years, that assistance has taken various forms. Uh, and most recently, there's been a focus more intense focus on housing, given the changes and the demands and the emergency we're facing on housing, not just in Somerville, but the region. As communities in greater Boston and greater Boston area work to address the housing emergency, it's crucial that local governments have community partners they can work with, and the Somerville Community Corporation has done that in a number of ways. Through a combination of developing affordable housing units and partnering with us on programs like the 100 Homes Program, uh, which is a great success <laughs> to working with the whole community to launch for the first time ever our own community land trust which is remarkable <clears throat> the SEC has helped grow our affordable housing stock uh, permanently affordable housing units provide as we know stability for residents now and ensure that there will be affordable housing available for future generations we know that challenge is immense today the challenge of prosperity and with great progress and there has been great economic progress in some of them. however there is great loss aligned with that we have recognized that there is loss not everyone is getting to participate in an authentic way in that economic future whether it's access to all the new jobs coming in uh, whether it's uh, using the green line station that perhaps they spent decades advocating for along with their neighbors or renting or buying a home or starting a business in the city that they love um, but the Somerville Community Corporation has been an incredible, important part along with others to make sure that we recognize that loss and that we are bold in our decisions for the future to ensure that people have a real option and opportunity to participate in that future. Through programs like the First Source Job Program, the SEC helps connect Somerville residents uh, with local jobs and we know that access to a good job goes a long way in helping to secure housing and working locally uh, can improve, we know, if we work locally, we can improve an employee's quality of life and help them save money in other areas like, like commuting costs. Uh, with financial literacy classes and in the, the first time home buyers program, SEC empowers people to make choices that will help them reach their goals. By helping residents meet their basic needs, the Sum of the Community Corporation is also helping to build the entire community. The SEC has initiatives specifically aimed at grassroots organizing and community building. And we are thankful for that. I also like to think of one of the most effective ways they've done that is through their housing jobs and financial initiatives. When residents have, and this is common sense folks, when residents have stable housing, when they have a good job, and when they have some financial stability, and they're more, more likely to feel invested in any community, especially in Somerville, and they're more uh, probable to get involved. And as Somerville continues to change, we need to make sure we're hearing as many voices as possible so we understand the context of people's challenges. Uh, I was asked again to reflect today on SEC's next 50 years. Um, I was gonna 
answer that. Well, in a perfect world, we wouldn't need an SEC. I would say in any perfect world, SEC and organizations like that play an important part and role in any community. Um, all, every stakeholder me, needs to be aligned. Every organization needs to be aligned with one orienting value with all its residents. The sum of a community corporation certainly embodies that. Uh, there's not a knock on them on their work, but a, a hopeful vision of the future where, where everyone has access to affordable housing, good jobs, and financial stability is a goal that we all have. I don't know if we're going to get there in the next 50 years. I think we need to be ethical in that, in that response, but I know that if we are bold, if we are progressive and we partner with community uh, organizations like the SEC and we empower those organizations and community to take that lead, the likelihood of us achieving that goal is much greater. Uh, I thank you for allowing me to work with you, Danny, and everyone in the SEC board over the years I've served uh, in public office, and I thank you for the impact you had on everyone's life. Happy birthday. Yeah. I hope you brought your bathing suit. <laughs> So thank you again, Mr. Mayor. And what um, the mayor alluded to with bringing a bathing suit uh, is that um, we received a very unique pledge from the mayor for today. And uh, even though this is not a fundraising event, um, we have an opportunity for you all here today. So coming into today's event, we had sponsorship of over $180,000. So amazing, pretty awesome. And it turns out uh, that when folks see results, they wanna support that, makes sense. And we're hoping that many of you here this morning will pledge your support to SCC as well. And um, <clears throat> we're hoping that so many of you pledge your support that the mayor will jump into the river today in his clothes at the end of yes <laughs> no no backing up so um so we have until 9 50 a.m so let's synchronize our watches here uh there are pledge cards on your tables and uh anything to say about this mr mayor <laughs> and now it's my pleasure uh, to present SEC's longtime CEO, who's been at SEC for 19 years. Also, maybe needs no introduction, kind of like Cher, Madonna, it's Danny. <laughs> Thanks, Libby. A good morning, Somerville! I always wanted to do that, and that's the extent of my Robin Williams impression, believe me. Um, have been here for 19 years. Trusty reading glasses. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, as, as Libby said, my name is Danny LeBlanc, and I have been here for quite some time, uh, although not 50 years. Um, 50 years! Think about it for a minute. 50 years is a long time. On June 25th, 1969, a dozen hardy souls, the mayor alluded to this a little bit, met at the home of Carla Johnston in Davis Square. Some people remember. <laughs> um, and they signed the paperwork to create the articles of the organization for the Somerville Corporation. I'll get back to that a little bit. Anybody remember Somerville from 1969, three years old, right, Mayor Curt Tony? Other people? I wasn't here then, but I did arrive in late 1976, fresh from college out at UMass in Amherst. I then had the good fortune to work here as a young community organizer for several years and got to know a lot about Somerville and about the Somerville Corporation. So it wasn't part of my script, but for those of you who didn't know him and don't, uh, don't remember him, Paul Duhamel over there on the right, that photograph was the first director. John Hickson worked for him. Um, and the story of Somerville and of SCC over the last 50 years are really closely connected. In those early days, we did things like start Project Soup, the first feeding program in the post-depression era 
because people in Somerville were hungry. And we hired a couple of consumer advocates to help pe prevent people from getting their heat shut off in the winter. It was still legal then in Massachusetts. Again, because the Somerville Corporation could not stand idly by while some people were going to be cold in our city. You see, it always was and still is about the people in Somerville. What we might call our folks, what Mayor Curtitone sometimes refers to as the soul of our city. While a city of mostly poor working people, the door to the old multi-service center, which some of us remember well, on the Wesley Park side of the old Methodist Church in Union Square, was a window into the vibrancy of this community. As the late 70s rolled into the early 80s, it became increasingly apparent that Somerville was becoming a more attractive place to live, especially for younger folks, as we could begin to see in rising housing costs. As did many community development organizations in the region, SCC began to build and to fight for more affordable housing to meet the needs. Again, it was about the people of Somerville, but now they needed housing they could afford. While young folks started moving into Somerville, today we'd call them millennials, but I guess they were actually baby boomers like me at the time, Somerville continued its long history of serving as a gateway for new immigrants. Only now the immigrants were people of color, from Haiti, from El Salvador, and other parts of the world. Wonderful diversity and vibrancy in the community, but that sometimes comes with some unavoidable tensions we all have to recognize, especially when it comes to race. When some of those tensions bubbled over at Somerville High School, SCC was on the scene with our then newly minted Somerville Mediation Program ready to help resolve some of those uh, conflicts peacefully with young people. What we started at Somerville High back at 1990 continues to this day as a key component of the development of young people in our high school. Yeah, thank you. By the way, I said Somerville Corporation before. Some smart leaders of our organization uh, decided to add the name community to our title legally in the late 1980s as well. And of course, we had always been rooted in the community, but they decided it was really important to state that in our name. Hence, we are ever since known as the Somerville Community Corporation. Um, many people began to recognize homelessness as a problem in the mid 80s across the Commonwealth, across the nation as though it sprang forth uh, out of whole cloth. I, I think we all know that that wasn't true, but it began to be recognized as a problem. That was around the time that the Somerville Homeless uh, Coalition began in Somerville to serve people with shelters for, for housing who, who were finding themselves on the streets. But many people, including SEC, also believed that trying to prevent that homelessness in the first place was a key thing to do. And so SEC, again, jumped into the fray. For many years, we did what people call housing search and assisting people who might otherwise be losing their housing to stay in place. Another part of our history. As the 90s and 2000s wore on, you can see I'm moving quicker now, right? <laughs> We also recognize that you sometimes have to advocate and plan and fight. And sometimes you have to plan to fight in order to meet the needs that we all know are out there as a community. We have for the last 20 years at least been known as one of the community development organizations in greater Boston that really does do solid community organizing and planning as the mayor referenced and that results in very concrete gains for all of us in the community. Things like um, linkage fees to support affordable housing and passing the Community Preservation Act which the mayor <laughs> kindly led for us. Uh, in increasing the percentage of our inclusionary zoning requirements so that we can have more affordable housing. 
Those kinds of things come about when we pull together as a community, decide what we need and work together to make them happen. That's what organizing and planning is about in our world. We also have long believed, and especially today as change is so rapid in, in, in the world, but also in Somerville in particular, that we need to preserve the best of what we've had in our community over time. Uh, ac across the highway over there, some people are familiar, but if you go across the highway and down one light, you'll be at what we now call St. Polycarp Village. Well, St. Polycarp Parish began in the mid-1920s as a satellite parish of St. Anne's Church in Winter Hill uh, in Somerville. And, you know, lo and behold, 75 years later, with demographic changes, St. Poly, the Catholic Archdiocese closed St. Polycarps, and those people went back to St. Anne's in Winter Hill, but it left a campus there. And I think our outlook, and I think the outlook of many people in this community, was that we should preserve the best of what's there. And that's one example where we've been, at, we've been able to create 84 new units of affordable housing, keep the church running as a place of worship. Today it's with a, a Haitian uh, evangelical congregation, replacing the former Roman Catholic organization, and we also preserved the other historically uh, preservation-worthy building with the rectory uh, that has been occupied by a couple of nonprofits. Just one example of paying attention to what we need to preserve in our community. I'll give you one more that many of you have heard about recently. You know, Somerville, I like to say these days that Somerville was really built a hundred years ago, uh, and it's all the two and three family homes that we know and love so well. And if you walk around Somerville today, it is actually being rebuilt for the next century. I sometimes joke that we're keeping the depot thrown in business because there is so much renovation going on. There are porta potties on every block, by the way, if you need to use a restroom in Somerville. <laughs> But that is evidence of massive change and revitalization. It also, as the mayor alluded to, it can threaten to displace lower income people. So in, in partnership with the city and with the Mass Housing Investment Corporation, we've been running the what we call the 100 Homes Program for the last three or four years. And we've, uh, I don't know, I lose track of the number, but I think we're up to about, uh, Scott Heyman can tell me, maybe, I think we're about to get up to 73 units total. I think we're at 62, and we're in the process of buying 11 more. Uh, and those will be permanently affordable homes. So I know I'm going to run out of time, and I'm going to say a, a, just a couple of words about the next 50 years, uh, uh, like the mayor did. W what I really want to say about that is, when you, th when you think about Somerville and SCC from 1969, and you look around today, you realize that none of us really knows what's going to happen. If you were here in 1969, you could not have imagined the Somerville of 2019. Couldn't imagine the world of 2019 when I when I think back to three television stations that I could get as a kid, you know, trying to watch baseball games. <laughs> but as we look ahead to the next 50 years, I believe the one constant we can rely on is that SEC will do and continue to do whatever it takes to serve this community and the people in this community. Thank you. And now I, I have the distinct pleasure of in introducing um, a better speaker than me, uh, somebody who's more skilled, and I'm actually thrilled to have her here. I'm going to be honest, I haven't had the pleasure of meeting her yet, so I'm going to meet her right now. Others at SCC have, but I know her work. Uh, so I'm going to introduce Carolyn Crockett. <laughs> May Many of us who, who either grew up here or uh, came to live here as adults know uh, some of the history and some of the story about the planned Interstate 95 route through Boston uh, corridor and the community, successful community fight to defeat what would have been a really destructive development in, in a day when highways ru ruled supreme. Well, Carolyn Crockett can tell us a lot about that because she's written a book on this, and we're really thrilled to have her here. Um, Carolyn earned a PhD 
from uh, the American Studies program at Yale University and a Master of Science in Geography from the London School of Economics and a Master of Arts in Religion from Yale Divinity School. Way more education than I ever got. <laughs> Her research focuses on large-scale land use changes, hence looking at something like Interstate 95 in the 20th century American cities and examines the social and geographic implications of structural poverty. Her dissertation, People Before Highways, Reconsidering Routes to and from the Boston Anti-Highway Movement, that's the book I was referring to, investigates a 1960s era, 1969, right, rings a bell, uh, grassroots movement to halt the urban extension of an interstate highway system through Boston and forms the basis of her new book of that name. She now teaches in the Department of Urban Studies and uh, Planning at, at MIT. Before that, Carolyn served as the Director of Economic Policy and Research and Director of the Small Business Development for the City of Boston. Carolyn Crockett. We look to the future with a keen sense of anticipation. We are living in an exciting and wonderful era. We are living in an exciting and wonderful country. We are living in an exciting and wonderful city. And, now, and New Somerville is not a reality, but it is no longer a dream. The die has been cast. The corner has been turned, and Somerville has been committed to an upward course that will gain in momentum, and from which there is no turning back. Certainly, we know that many of our problems will continue, and that new ones will arise. We know the difficulties and the challenges will be many, but we welcome them and look to the future with courage and confidence. We realize that the road to the goals we have set will be difficult and demanding. These are the words of your mayor, or rather your previous mayor, Mayor James Brennan, as he addressed a public audience, including the Board of Aldermen and the School Committee of Somerville on January 6, 1969. More than 50 years ago, Somerville faced an existential crisis. And many people wondered if the city would survive. And if these remarks that I've read are any indication, the mayor himself, Mayor Brennan, was gravely concerned. In honor of the history that we are marking today and the future we are invoking, I've entitled my remarks, Moving Beyond Dreams and Into the Dream-Filled Work of Doing the Impossible. The Somerville Community Corporation at 50, what now? I am honored and excited to be here with you this morning. Danny, thank you for that lovely introduction. Uh, it is an honor to follow Mayor Curtitone, someone who I have admired for such a very long time. Often in my role as the Director of Economic Policy in the City of Boston, I said, what is Curtitone doing? What's going on in Somerville? So I would read the paper, I would try to figure out what's going on, and I would say, Mayor, Mayor Walsh, come on, let's go. So thank you so much for being a beacon of light. A powerful, visionary, unifying force for this city and so many others right in your midst. I thank you. I salute you. Absolutely. Uh, what an incredible opportunity to celebrate 50 powerful years of community building and struggle. And what an incredibly staggering record of self-determination, witness, and fortitude. It is an incredibly, this is an incredibly important moment to reflect, to dream ahead, and I would say to recommit to all the things that have made the Somerville Community Corporation's successful journey possible. Somerville is a special community, and not just because of the honk fest, <laughs> though that's pretty good, or because it is the birthplace of fluff, that magical concoction that made my childhood glorious. I don't know about yours. Uh, Somerville is special 
uh, because this is a community that gets things done. Yes, yes, yes. And is not afraid to lean into its ideals and dreams, even when it may not seem convenient, popular, easy, or even feasible. Whether you're storing gunpowder for the American Revolution, or you're fighting interstate highways, or you're making a sanctuary for immigrants from all over the world, you show us all, yes. You show us all what radical and radically inclusive democracy and good planning can look like. And for 50 years, 50 years, I love saying it too, that's a big number. It's a big number. The SCC has helped define what's possible and necessary when others were not quite so sure. This is the very definition of leadership. At a time when Washington DC, yeah, and arguably all branches of our national government are showing little to no leadership, we need cities like Somerville and organizations like the Somerville Community Corporation now more than ever to keep us straight and to straighten us out. Yes? Yes. Please continue to do what you do best. Stand up and fight for residents and social ideals that matter. Good jobs, affordable housing, resident-led planning and organizing. This is the work. This is the work that builds the beloved community that we need now and forever. And you are no stranger to that work because you've birthed yourself and you've cut your teeth on that right. SCC is an organization that matters, that empowers and transforms entire communities because this organization starts with the fundamental idea that people in this community have the power, the strength, and the intelligence to decide what's, what's important, what needs to get done, and can come together and rally and actually get it done. In 2019, this point is so obvious that it almost makes your speaker seem kind of silly, maybe even dense for mentioning it. But in 1969, this was nothing but revolutionary thinking. When Mayor Brennan gave his midterm address that I read to you in 1969, things were bleak, and he knew it. He not only spoke about the future and how much it was anticipated, but he also spoke about the many challenges he faced as a new mayor. He continues to say, he says, my fellow citizens, when I assumed the office of mayor one year ago, I found that Somerville, like many other cities, was trapped on a treadmill. Costs were spiraling upwards, the tax base was dwindling, and its physical plant was worn out. The city needed just about everything. Public works needed equipment. New trucks, plows, payloaders, sweepers, rubbish packers, compressors, pumps, shovels, hammers and chisels, hammers and chisels, and all the tools that are so vital to carry out the day-to-day -day services of efficiently operating a modern city. Our schools were in trouble. They all needed and still need a lot of work. He says the school consolidation plan was running way behind. Damage to schools from vandalism was staggering. Vandalism was a problem in other areas too. Hundreds of parking meters were smashed and out of operation. The municipal incinerator was in need of repairs. Mayor Brennan lays out a very, 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 very long list of problems and debts and funding shortfalls and his deep concerns over where the money would come from and how to fix the city's mess. Even the incinerator was broken. In every way, the city was on fire. This was not an uplifting tribute to resident activism, but a cry for help from a worried mayor. The city of Somerville as Boston at the time and many parts of Cambridge were struggling for survival. From 1950 to 1990, Somerville, like Boston, steadily lost population to other cities and the surrounding suburbs. 
Politicians were literally wringing their hands and coming up with all kinds of new, desperate, money-chasing ideas that were terrible at best. This was a time for city residents to take matters into their own hands. In this firestorm of city making and debate, the SCC was born. From its very beginning, SCC was literally in the business of feeding and protecting this community from the ground up. Bowls of soup, social services, and a sense of home and belonging became the essential ingredients for nurturing every revolutionary battle that this organization has waged. When clearance for urban renewal and interstate highway expansion threatened to erase hardworking communities right off the map from coast to coast, organizations like the SCC fought back by saying that the people who live here right now matter right now. At a time when Dr. Martin Luther King asked the question, where do we go from here, chaos or community? SCC chose community and has not looked back. Dr. King wrote a book of this same title. Many of you may know it, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community. He wrote this book in 1967, and it was the last full-length book that Dr. King would write before being murdered in the following year of 1968. I hope you'll forgive the gender conventions of the time, but are able to hear the intent of his message. He dedicates this book, Where Do We Go From Here, quote, to the committed supporters of the civil rights movement, Negro and white, whose steadfastness amid confusions and setbacks gives us assurance that brotherhood will be the condition of man, not the dream of man. So despite this dated uh, and problematic pronoun convention in use, <laughs> Dr. King is imploring us to choose human connection, to choose the bond of community, to choose mutuality as our rightful daily condition and not a dream. In this writing, King toils with the chaos and dissension that was bubbling up and through the civil rights movement as a younger generation continued to question integration as a goal and nonviolent civil disobedience as a tactic. Black nationalist calls for black power and armed resistance concerned him, frustrated him, and made him question the movement's ability to grow and continue to, to advance the type of gains won in the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act. This was the cauldron in which you were born. You hear in his voice, in his writings, his frustration, and his rumination as he clearly ponders what's next, even as he sometimes seems to console himself. He writes, the line of progress is never straight. For a period, a movement may follow a straight line. And then, and then, it encounters obstacles and the path bends. It's like curving around a mountain when you are approaching a city Often it feels as though you're moving backward and you lose sight of your goal. But in fact, you're moving ahead and soon you will see the city again closer by. This is 1967 when so many national liberation movements were hanging in the balance, forward or back, chaos or community. The future was uncharted and less than hopeful. In 1966 and 67, when many veteran civil rights and anti-war organizers in Boston, Cambridge, and Somerville took to the streets to fight back against the state's plan to bring I-95 and its looped inner belt through our metropolitan core, no one knew what would happen. And in fact, most people thought that it was utterly impossible to stop a federal highway from tearing through economically disinvested and poor multiracial neighborhoods where most residents were dismissed as politically irrelevant. This project represented not only a 10 to 12 lane highway bringing 160,000 additional cars to the heart of greater Boston, but also a billion dollars of federal investment which highway abutting cities and towns were thirsty for, most especially the city of Boston. And although by many accounts this fight was largely successful, I-95 and the inner belt were stopped, 
and nearly a billion dollars were redirected to improvements to the MBTA, extending the red line, redirecting the orange line, and improving Amtrak and commuter rail service. It's even more terrifying to think about what the condition of the red line might be like <laughs> without <laughs> this period of improvement. Uh, all these things were good, but we're not done. And we all know that Somerville experienced and continues to experience the shadow side of this victory, which resulted in the extension of I-95 <laughs> through the neighborhoods and the knock-on effects of displacement, pollution, and congestion that continue. I know this battle is not over. And I know that the mitigation of I-95, I-93, rather, and the Green Line extensions are hard-won gains that many here have demanded and won. For five decades, you have defied the odds and built an urban future that was deemed impossible. What many people forget or do not know is that in the middle of all of the highway battles of the 60s, we were in the midst of a housing crisis, a shortage of good, affordable housing, a fight that continues and that you stand as leaders of, and we thank you, and we thank you, and we thank you. That fight continues, and that struggle is real. So while we talk about the fact that we defeated a highway, the reality is we are still absolutely engaged in the battle of our lives to define a city and a region that matters, that we can be proud of, and that we can all say that we are still here for now and 50 years in the future where our, res our residents, our neighbors, our friends and family members will remember this moment when we had a chance to stand up, to claim, to cra to claim ground right here and to say enough is enough. That is the legacy of SCC that we advance, that we celebrate, and that we honor. And so now, I say to you, what now? Somerville is a special place, no question. You have been recognized as one of the densest cities uh, in New England uh, and the best run city in Massachusetts, but what is the real secret here? Is it a secret diet of fluffernut or sandwiches? I can't help but mention that as often as I can, I love it. Um, but in truth, it is your fire, your determination, your grit, your creativity, your leadership, and your ability to listen and to lead, that is your true special sauce. So today, SCC, as you celebrate 50 years and continue to move beyond dreams into the dream-filled work of doing the impossible, I say congratulations, 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 and please keep going. We need you now more than ever. You answer the prayers and the wishes of so many people 50 years ago who would not have imagined that this could be possible. From your previous mayor to civil rights leaders who have implored you from the grave to choose community and not chaos. From residents, from activists, from your entire region that says thank you and congratulations. This is a day to celebrate and to look forward and to know that together it is absolutely possible, necessary, and essential. Thank you. Another round of applause for Dr. Kraken. Just soaking it in. And feeling and and getting a sense from others too, kind of in the space of pride, right? Of this city that we're a part of and that we work really hard and care for. Uh, And now uh, we're gonna switch gears to be a little more personal. Um, uh, there's someone who's gonna be talking about her experiences in Somerville and her career path and the effect that working with SCC has had uh, on her career path. <clears throat> she was, she, when I was talking to a staff member at SCC about her and about her talk today, she was called a rock star. So I think you're in for a treat. Um, so please welcome Charlene Stallworth. Yeah. 
who is an active member of SC Speed. Okay. Um, all right, good morning, everyone. My name is Charlene Stallworth. Um, I'd like to talk to you today about the past five years of my life. Uh, I was born and raised out in New Jersey, um, nice little town uh, where uh, I joined the Army when I was 17. Uh, shortly thereafter, I uh, leaving the military and um, my military career, I experienced homelessness and it was hard for me to find a job. Um, I was suffering from PTSD at the time. Uh, I went to Iraq in 2008 and 2009, and it was hard for me to kind of readjust to a civilian life again um, and find normal jobs and just be kind of like the old Charlene before the military. Um, so basically, um, I got in touch with a social worker out in New Jersey, uh, and sometime in 2015, I uh, decided to come to Boston. Uh, I have researched a whole bunch of states and cities that uh, could help out with veterans a little bit. Um, place that was kind of interesting. Uh, I looked, I explored a bunch of different um, cities and I kind of ended up with Boston. Um, so basically, and I've always been a Celtics fan even out in Jersey. <laughs> so uh, it kind of worked for me. Um, so I stayed at a couple shelters out in uh, Northampton, I made my way over to uh, Boston. Uh, I then found an apartment in Chelsea. I started working immediately at a bunch of kitchens in Boston. Um, I knew that I enjoyed cooking. It was something that I've experienced and enjoyed since I was a little kid. I remember just not even being tall enough to stand over the stove, but always there. Um, and I enjoyed it, but I knew I didn't have any culinary school experience. Um, so ultimately, this left me with very few choices. Um, uh, it left me with very few choices, including low wages, no benefits, and basically no room for growth within companies. Uh, I had the passion, uh, but I didn't have the foundation or the tools that I needed to further my career. After three long years of working at, uh, let's see, I worked at Chipotle when I first moved to Massachusetts. Uh, that was my first job, kind of got broken in with that. And the crazy winter in 2015 was also my first winter in Massachusetts as well, um, which broke me in in style too. Um, so it was Chipotle, and I'm not sure if it, anybody have heard of Sapa near downtown crossing next to uh, the Boston Housing Authority. I worked there for about two years as their head cook there. Um, eventually, I started realizing that I need to go to school and, you know, start getting paid what I, you know, what I'm worth around here, you know. So eventually, <laughs> uh, eventually, um, I basically, eventually, I found the Somerville program, uh, the Somerville Community Program, where I signed up for the culinary classes with the First Source program. Um, with this program, I, I obtained the Safe Surf and a um, Allergen Awareness certification, which gave me I a small curve and a good advantage to applying for better jobs. Um, they also helped me sign up for classes at Bunker Hill Community College where I did three semesters, um, but it was, I did three semesters and I dropped out uh, because I couldn't work and go to school at the same time. It was just too much for me personally. Uh, so I chose experience over education um, at that point. Um, eventually, um, I started this, uh, I got the certifications, and this empowered me to apply to different jobs in Boston uh, for, with, that had competitive wages, um, great benefits, and uh, I was seeking valuable experience at this point. Uh, I began to apply at hotels in Boston. I eventually landed a job at the Envoy um, in the Seaport District. Uh, it's known for its rooftop bar there. Uh, it was just built and just opened in 2015, so it's pretty fresh. Um, it already has uh, rated best hotel in Boston uh, twice since 2015. Um, while I was working at the Envoy, I gained uh, an immense amount of knowledge and experience there. Uh, I worked with a chef called Tatiana Rosana. Uh, she won Chop twice, and she's been on Beat Bobby Flay, so she's kind of like the celebrity chef in the kitchen, and she like freaks me out every time she's around me. Um, but I love her a lot. Um, I had the pleasure of working with her while I was at the rooftop bar um, and at the Envoy. Uh, she taught me a lot of stuff personally. Um, 
she personally worked with me a lot and just taught me just a lot of stuff that I can carry forever in my career. Um, I started to make a decent wage at this point uh, once I started working at the Envoy. Um, started making a decent wage, things started working out, things started uh, becoming better for me. Um, working with the First Source program gave me the skills that I needed uh, and provided me, uh, prepared me to work at the Envoy. Um, while working there for about six months, I was able to save money. Um, I was able to save money, save money, uh, save a lot of money. I paid off some debt and I bought a new car. I haven't driven in maybe 10 years. Um, and I just got a brand new car and it, life's just been great. I've been able to travel home anytime I feel like it when I have the energy, I guess. Um, and just visit my family more often and just explore Boston. I've been here for five years and ever since I have the car, it seems like I'm still learning Boston. Um, and I, I still don't know where I'm going. If I didn't have my phone, I'd be in the sauce somewhere. Um, so basically, um, my life has drastically changed for the better. Uh, my career in culinary has, is blasting off. Um, it's always been uh, my goal in life to uh, continue, always continue to learn and uh, succeed in anything that I do in life. So knowing naturally being the person that I am, uh, I elected to continue to find better jobs and better positions and better experiences with other sous chefs. Uh, so I continue to apply for better positions. I received an offer uh, about two months ago from the, uh, from the Encore Hotel and Casino in Everett, uh, where I'm currently working as a cook. Uh, the Encore offers fantastic benefits, uh, a great competitive uh, wage, and it's a, a highly valuable experience that I will be gaining there. Uh, being part of the opening team at the Encore at the casino has really been a dream come true. Uh, I tell people this all the time when it doesn't matter what mood you're in, that building just gives you some type of energy like it just they want you to be excellent uh the encore excellence and uh, be perf be a perfectionist and it's really a way of life it's not just you're an employee it's a it's a way of life you go home thinking and dreaming about the job and the casino uh, or it has for me at least um so basically um I got the job at the casino as part of the opening team i'm, uh, I'm working closely with the uh, executive chef adam cube who's uh pretty uh, famous kind of well-known chef in, in Boston. Um, I was able to completely elevate my career with the help of this program, uh, with the help of Daniel and Blake, who worked with me closely uh, during, my, uh, during this journey. Uh, I've come a long way, but I'm determined to succeed. Uh, my passion for cooking has become my life's calling. Uh, eventually, I like to open an eatery here in Boston where it feels like home and everything seems to be working out. Um, lastly, I'd like to thank everyone here at the Somerville Community Corporation um, uh, for giving me the opportunity to work with you guys and motivating me. Everybody um, that I worked with so far here has been great. Um, and I just want to start a business at this point and keep furthering my career. Thank you. And now, uh, without further ado, our next speaker is Matt Triano of AAF, and he's going to share uh, the experience of being a partner and sponsor. And it's important to note that um, Matt is with AAF, who does the audit of SCC every year. And to know that somebody who, like, you know, does a deep dive into what's happening in SCC and still supports the organization, I think is an important, um, important thing to know. So, <laughs> thank you, Matt. Yeah, well, please welcome Matt. Good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, happy to be here today to support SCC at their 50th celebration. Uh, it's a real milestone for any organization to achieve. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm a partner with AFCPAs. We've been working uh, as business par partners with SCC for, I think, going on 15 years now. Um, we do a lot in the affordable housing space. Uh, you know, we really have a, a, a true passion for the work. Um, working with organizations that make a true impact in the community and we're able to watch neighborhoods transform um, through the different work that they do such as the you know the access to jobs uh, the community organization and of course um, the building of affordable housing SCC has always been special to me because uh, I, I am a local guy as well I grew up in Malden but my family is originally from Somerville um, you know my my grandparents emigrated here and 
uh, would have been lovely for, to have them be able to be supported by an organization at, like SEC when they first came here. Unfortunately, that was not quite in place yet. Um, so, you know, as we've been working with SEC over the years, we've really watched them grow. Uh, they've had a lot of continuous but substantial growth. And, you know, they, they don't want to stop there. Uh, and SEC really has some ambitious goals, uh, especially with fundraising around their 50th. Um, so, you know, we've, we've come in as their corporate sponsor this year, um, and we're really hoping that you'll join us in pledging um, to support them throughout their, their 50th anniversary, uh, especially as we'd like to see the mayor jump into the water today. Um, so, you know, for those of you that are charitably inclined, um, I know today's not a fundraiser, but I thought I would just say a quick thing. Um, you know, one of the things we utilize with SCC it, through uh, fundraising is their uh, access to the community investment tax credit. Um, for those of you that uh, aren't aware, I, and I think SEC has done a really good job of um, making sure that the individuals in the community know about this program, um, but it's a tax incentive in Massachusetts where uh, CDCs like SCC, where you can donate to them and 50% of your donation comes back to you through a tax credit on your um, Massachusetts income tax return. Um, so it, it's, it's a really beneficial way to give and you can really almost double your impact to an organization. Um, you know, so that, that is something that, that we've done with SCC and uh, certainly if you have any questions about that or how the program works, I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions uh, afterwards. And uh, you know, from a contact SCC standpoint, you would want to reach out to uh, Meredith um, otherwise, you know, I really just am here to uh, say congratulations and best of luck for the next 50. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so for those of you who synchronized your watches, we are down to the wire. Um, and there's only a few more minutes to ensure that the mayor jumps into the river. I want you to not let this opportunity pass you by, <laughs> right? So, um, uh, you know, we don't want to have any regrets. And I want you to think about that famous quote, which is, you know, you want to dance like no one's watching and you want to pledge like the mayor is not going to be dry by 10 o'clock. Okay? <laughs> Great. Now, uh, I'd like to spend a little time saying thank yous as you all think about being part of that group of folks who are thanked. Um, in your programs, we would like to uh, say a special thank you to our event sponsors, uh, Tufts University, Somerville Media Center, Meg Mainzer Cohen, Red Bones, Davis Square Architects, Nancy McArty, McArdle, um, and Christine Barber. And then all the folks who helped make today in particular come together, and we're very thankful for their support and contributions Paddle Boston, Jules Catering, Union Square Donuts. Did you see those little donut holes? Did folks get a donut hole? Man, awesome. Uh, Stephanie Taves Mailing, the artistic director, and the event planning team. I'm not going to butcher all of your names. I can probably only pronounce my own correctly 50% of the time. So that's an awesome team that's come together to support this event. And to Mayor to Tony uh, for his support. And on the back of your program, the folks who are pledging to support the 50th anniversary year for SCC. And we hope that um, many of your names will be on another uh, program in the future.